This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact. We've got questions for Charlotte's new mayor, Vi Lyles. I'm Jeff Sonier. Stick around. We'll take you upstairs to the top floor of the government center for our interview in the corner office. Coming up, the question is, is there hope when you have mental health issues? Well, there's a way. Plus, no one is immune to cyber attacks these days, including government agencies. We'll tell you the important lessons learned from Mecklenburg County. Carolina Impact starts right now. Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. After just over a year in office, how's Charlotte's new mayor doing? What's her biggest controversy? Her proudest accomplishment? And what's next on her agenda? They're the questions that could affect all of us, and tonight we get some of the answers. Carolina Impact's Jeff Saunier sits down with Mayor Vi Lyles one-on-one -on -one at the Government Center for a look back at year one, a look ahead to year two, and maybe beyond. Yeah, Vi Lyles is the new Charlotte mayor who's not really that new here at the Government Center, not when it comes to knowing the city's history, knowing the city's problems, and in particular, knowing who to call and hopefully how to get things done here. We have a bright future ahead, and I am proud to be your mayor. Vi Lyle's first year leading the city comes after more than 30 years serving the city, working with 10 previous mayors on the Charlotte City Council, and before that on the city staff. First mayor you worked under as a staffer, who was that? John Bell. He could always tell a great story. And, you know, telling a story is what people remember. You're in charge of a different kind of city than back in the days of John Belk or Harvey Gant or even more recently than that. It's a lot more diverse. It's a lot more polarized. Oh, absolutely. Um, I had a meeting with Harvey Gant and I said, one of my goals is to be what you, do what you did. Harvey could listen to 11 different opinions and at the end of it, he could make everybody feel like the decision was theirs. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have to be mayor and you have to make tough decisions, but you have to really care about the community. So the time that you spend outside of this office is to work with everyone to make sure that they understand. I humbly and gratefully accept your nomination for the presidency of the United States. Not everybody understands one of Mayor Lyle's early decisions to push hard for Charlotte to host next year's Republican National Convention, even as Democrats who supported Lyles for mayor were pushing back. We have a moral obligation to say no. I do want Charlotte to host a Republican National Convention someday. I do not want that day to be in the summer of 2020. Thank you. You managed to steer clear of most controversy in your first year as mayor, but probably the biggest controversy was with your own party, with the whole RNC. Being trusted and authentic in, in yourself as in this job is very, very important. We've told people that we would be willing to do this and we were doing it for the right reasons. Those reasons were to showcase Charlotte's values, our diversity, our ability to welcome people with different opinions. Let's go forward. I think that what I didn't realize was the number of people that really weren't around for the Democratic Convention. Didn't see the economic impact, didn't see people working and making twice as much as they had made in a week doing that kind of thing. They only saw the politics, they didn't see the benefits. I think that they saw the benefits, but they weren't as real. When you've gone through it, you see that reality. Here's another reality that Lyle saw as a city council member that she inherited as mayor. Protests in the streets about the police and the problems facing Charlotte's lowest income neighborhoods, and mostly about not being heard. I try not to judge, and I try not to say, I'm here to tell you something that you have to believe. What I'm here to do is to share the information that we know. And I believe that's the only way our community is going to come together. You have got to have relationships in this community that you can call and you can say, this is what we know so far. I never say this is what we know, period. What Lyles heard during those protests and what she still hears today as mayor is that Charlotte's prosperity is out of reach for many citizens, especially when it comes to finding good jobs or good schools 
or an affordable place to live. Lyle says $50 million in new city funding for more housing is just a start. You know, this housing has, has been something that's very, very important to me, but I've worked on it for a very long time. And sometimes you can kind of get stuck in that place. The thing that I am most proud of is that when we were talking about our housing referendum last year, I knew that wasn't enough to really move the ball. The work with our private sector community to say we will support you in this, I believe that is the achievement that I'm most proud of a step forward. Let's put it that way. This is a step forward because we are working with um, people that are engaged. Now it always helps that we're in a good economy right now, that our city is growing and people want to be a part of that growth. They want to see that energy. They want to see the opportunity and do something that's significant. You've got a lot of new council members serving, yeah. um, which can be both positive and negative when, it, you know, when you're trying to get things done. I think what you're seeing is the willingness to talk about what we aren't doing instead of what we are doing. And so the idea that council members advocate for what's not happening, that's a menu. Before, it was kind of like, here's your dinner, you eat what's on the plate. And that's not the case anymore. You have choices and this community is making those choices. And if we can talk about that in the community, that's if the community supports us, then we will be able to figure out how to pay for it. And if we can get those folks into the economy and they can have a family and a safe place to live and, and their kids can go to good schools, that's all we all want. That's what I want for my grandchildren and I want for every child in this community. So your biggest accomplishment is also, I guess, your biggest piece of unfinished business. It is. We've got a lot to do, but I feel that the, mom the momentum in this city is very positive. I, I'm not out front in front of it. I'm just pushing behind every day. Jeff joins us in the studio now. Jeff, I have to ask the question. Is she talking about running for re-election? Yeah, we asked her the question. She said yes. I don't know that she's made a formal announcement yet. So probably a lot of what we heard in our story we'll hear over the next couple of months as part of a campaign. You know, it's interesting. She bickers a lot with her fellow Democrats on city council. They don't always see eye to eye. It'll kind of be interesting to see if, if she does have a challenger, either in the general election or the primary, if it might be one of those um, council members that uh, oftentimes find themselves on different sides of the same issues with her. But uh, for now, at least, she's uh, very popular, and uh, there's no one out there, Republican or Democrat, that's talking about running against her. Well, and she did a very bold move by supporting the RNC. Yeah, that um, was probably a little bit unexpected on the part of a Democrat, but uh, as she said, you know, sometimes you put politics aside for the good of the city. And also it's about making promises and keeping promises. Uh, a lot of the folks, a lot of the opposition to the RNC came after some of the decisions had already been made. And I think that uh, it was more, as, as it was as much about credibility as it was about politics. And again, if you were here for the Democratic Convention, you saw what it did for our economy. Um, as she said in the story, a lot of the folks who opposed the Republican Convention weren't here to see what the Democrats did for Charlotte, and she's hoping the Republicans do the same. You know, she talks about being uh, pushing from behind <laughs> instead of being out front. You know, from a political standpoint, a lot of people might say that's a very intentional uh, political answer. But just seeing Vi and knowing her, she's so relational, she's great to be around. I'm not sure I would say that. I don't know if she's a natural politician. It might be a political position, but I don't know if it's a calculated kind of thing. You get the feeling when you talk to Mayor Lyles that um, she sees problems that the city's facing, not necessarily as a Republican way to fix them or a Democratic way to fix them. She seems to get past the party in a lot of cases or sometimes past the squabbles within her own party to find answers. That's That comes from working more than 30 years at City Hall before right. becoming you know, one of the folks that are elected at City Hall. So she's seen it from both sides. That's a lot of experience and a lot of uh, deal making that she brings to the table. One of the other things in the past Charlotte has uh, not had the best relationship <laughs> no. with our legislative friends in Raleigh. No. That seems to be doing a little better. Yeah, it couldn't be much worse than it was two years before Mayor Lyles with the whole HP2 debacle and, and Charlotte versus Raleigh. Uh, again, um, it's about mending fences uh, and it's about style. Uh, Vi Lyles, by going forward on the RNC, made a lot of friends among the Republicans in Raleigh. They saw her as being less political than her predecessor. Um, she's managed to avoid controversy, as we mentioned. And um, 
when you avoid controversy, you also avoid the tension that sometimes happens between Charlotte and Raleigh. She knows that there's mostly Republicans in Raleigh she's got to deal with. Um, if you go picking fights, then you're probably going to get a fight. She's trying to mend those fences now, I think, and, and doing it for the good of the city for the most part. Great information. Thanks so much, Jeff. We appreciate the inside story. Thanks. Long before most people had even heard of the Internet, there was a need for cybersecurity, and the first computer virus was reported in 1998. Just over 30 years later, cybercrime is a multi-billion dollar industry, and no one is immune. Carolina Impact's Jason Terzis shows us how some local governments were attacked and what they're doing to prevent it from happening again. The Wild Wild West bank robbery played out countless times in the movies and in real life. The bad guys come in, shoot up the place, and get out of town on horseback with all the money. On your horses, men, get out! The modern day version of the Western bank robbery, the cybersecurity attack. It may not have the guns or horses, but the end result is the same, a robbery. This is one of the largest data breaches in history. It With just about everyone and everything connected online, stealing passwords, personal information, and money is big business. With hacking groups employing highly trained developers who are constantly innovating new attacks. Yesterday's espionage stories are now today's cybersecurity stories and things that there were once spy movies are now actually being done against companies daily. Locally, Atrium Health's billing provider was hacked in November, affecting two and a half million patients. Just over a year ago, Mecklenburg County fell victim with a foreign-based hacker gaining access to an employee's computer login. It was a phishing email. It looked like it was an, an employee email going to another employee, and they clicked on it, um, and that allowed um, the hackers to be able to get in. That attack knocked 51 servers offline, causing widespread outages across the county systems. Your first instinct is, you know, it is a little scary because you're not really, you don't really understand sort of the depth and the scope of what the problem is. All you know is that, you know, bad guys have gotten in there and they're holding your, your information for ransom. The county acted quickly, taking all of its systems down. So we had the honor to work with them uh, on the forensics to figure out before they started doing recovery, were the bad guys still in the network? Where were they? What was the point of intrusion? We had to look at all of our servers to determine uh, which ones had been compromised. And then we had to actually clean those servers and then put all those applications um, back online. The hackers demanded two Bitcoin, roughly the equivalent of $23,000. We talked to Homeland Security, the FBI, the Secret Service. Um, we talked to Bank of America, a lot of our other corporate partners in town, and really try to get a sense of, you know, what they would do if they were us. And unilaterally, everybody told us, don't pay. The county refused to pay the ransom, a decision even applauded by the New York Times. Fortunately for the county, the decision was made easier by the fact it had a good backup system. Our ability to be able to take our backups and restore our systems was really um, one of the driving decision-making factors that we had. This county should be incredibly proud about the fact that criminals were not paid to get the systems back. A little over a month later, a similar situation played out at the Charlotte Housing Authority. We fell victim to a phishing attack. A former employee of ours received an email from someone she thought was internal um, asking for W-2s. Actually, the email mimicked our CEO's email. The W-2 forms were mistakenly sent out, containing employee social security numbers, addresses, and salary information. It was about a couple hundred employees who were impacted. Our residents were never impacted. All of our employees, past and present, who were impacted got life locked for two years. Government agencies aren't the only ones targeted. Small businesses make up 43% of cyber attacks. One of those recently affected was Southern Fried Chicks, an online clothing boutique based out of Fort Mill. With over a million and a half Facebook followers and another quarter million on Instagram, they became a prime target for hackers. Liz, who runs Southern Fried Chicks, called me the Friday before Black Friday. That is an incredible time of year for retailers, especially online retailers. Hackers had taken over her social media accounts and they were posting click-through porn. Within two days after the takeover, Southern Fried Chicks lost over 50,000 Facebook followers and $100,000 in potential sales. Fortunately, their business bounced back. But that's not always the case, as 60% of small businesses go out of business within six months of a cyber attack. So what's changed, and how can companies be more vigilant? Mecklenburg County spent over $7 million on security upgrades last year alone. We're you know, upgrading our entire network, um, we're buying a lot of additional tools that will help us um, be able to identify 
um, intrusions more effectively and really understand sort of if they get in, where are they and what are they doing. With over 90% of cyber attacks starting with a phishing email, the county is doing what it can to keep employees from getting tricked. We've really restricted the kind of websites our employees can go to. We're not allowed to access our home email from the office anymore. Um, we've implemented multi-factor authentication so that if you're outside and you want to access something internally, you have to go through a couple of steps in order to make that happen. The Charlotte Housing Authority is taking similar measures. If there's an outside email that comes in. Uh, all of our employees, we have a big yellow banner when it comes in that says this is an outside email. Be aware. The CHA also now requires all employees to undergo extensive cybersecurity training. We also have encrypted emails now if there's some personal information so that we tech personal information. If you don't have the password for that encrypted email, you can't have access to that, in that information. Keeping up with the latest technology is a must in the world of cybersecurity and the only way to stay ahead. Hackers continue to find ways to get in. As much as we try to get, keep them out, um, I think it's going to be an ongoing, an ongoing battle. We're learning just to be better, to be smarter, to be wiser, to communicate more with our um, employees, and also just to invest in those systems. It's, it's critical. The days of the wild, wild west shootout may be long gone, but the battles in the new frontier of cybersecurity are here for the foreseeable future. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Terzis reporting. Thanks so much, Jason. Industry insiders say always make sure websites you visit are reputable, especially with online banking. Remember to change passwords frequently, keeping them long, strong, and unique. And always keep an eye out for questionable emails. If they look suspicious, chances are they are. Well, one in five adults in our country suffer from mental illness. For one in every 25 adults, the mental illness is so severe it interrupts major life activities. Until recently, in Charlotte, many families had to go out of town for long-term care. Carolina Impact's B. Thompson introduces us to one young man and his family who spent the last 20 years on a difficult journey. But thanks to a unique care facility right here in Charlotte, he's on a firm road to recovery. Meditation. The path many follow to find their inner peace. But for Harrison, it's been a turbulent journey. I've been dealing with mental health issues my whole life. I guess I had a mother's intuition at, when he was in preschool that something was, was bothering him. At the age of six, Harrison was diagnosed with depression and ADD, or attention deficit disorder. With medications, he was stabilized. But later came the diagnosis of bipolar and schizophrenia, which he describes as a different kind of disease. It was a childhood of doctor visits and med checks and lots of different kinds of therapies. And I think Harrison grew up thinking that something was wrong with him that needed to be fixed. But then the medications became the double-edged sword. So I started to get really paranoid. I thought the medication was like poisonous. Um, and eventually I got hospitalized four times pretty in pretty quick succession. When a person goes into the hospital, it's a very sterile environment that is geared toward keeping the person safe. For Lee and Paul, parenting three boys, they saw their firstborn spiraling downward. And as an attorney, Paul knew the options were limited. In fact, uh, our jail system is the largest mental health provider in the state and in the country, in fact. And that typically is where someone suffering from a mental health problem will be sent. So when I learned about Hopeway, actually before ground was ever broken, my first thought was, oh, please, can you open tomorrow? There was a need in the Charlotte community to have a residential facility that filled the gap between hospital and home. Opening a little over two years ago, this facility is one of a kind in the Carolinas and provides residential and day curriculums for its clients in programs that utilize what's called integrative therapy. And the integrative therapies include art therapy, music therapy, recreational therapy, horticultural therapy, and we have a registered dietitian here. And what we find are all those things are important to a person's well-being. It's affecting all of our families. Um, in, a, in their lifetime. So maybe, you know, you've done well and then when you retire all of a sudden there's an issue with alcoholism or maybe you're a veteran and you've had PTSD and it doesn't come out until later in life or maybe you're a child who's 10 and having thoughts of suicide. So these affect 
everybody at any age. About 50 to 60 patients a day from 26 states and the Philippines all take part in therapies that include group and individual sessions. Many, like Harrison, use art to bring out their perceptions and fears. In creating the image outside of ourselves, creating the artwork, we've taken the story that's internal and we've made it external, and we can explore it from a different perspective. While Hopeway is a nonprofit, one thing is for certain. As the pedagogues who have health care insurance put it, for many, the devil is in financing the care. Typically, mental health issues are financially burdensome, and the hospitalizations typically last longer than the typical hospitalization for other physical illnesses. There's not enough federal funding, there's not enough state funding, there's lack of hospital beds, psychiatrists don't get paid enough, there are not enough medical professions going into the field. I could go on and on. Whether um, you're old or you're young or you have resources or you don't, these are brain diseases and we need to treat them just like we would hypertension or diabetes or cardiac disease. For this family, there came a day when hope was more than just a word. The very second day of his time there, I was sitting at the kitchen table and he came up and said, Mom, I think I'm gonna be okay. They all know it will be a journey. The staff at Hopeway challenging individuals to find their path to health and the pedagogues, supporting their son and putting in a lot of effort to help others who find themselves in the fight for the mental wellness of their loved one. And as for Harrison, well, he's spending time with a four-legged friend and he's taking steps towards his own path. No cars went by on the street. Not the tiniest sound could be heard anywhere. Establishing a career doing voice work in his home studio. But he knows his journey is not over, and he has a few words for those not quite sure of their journey's end. I'm doing well. I've got a lot of stuff going for me going forward. Um, I feel, you know, just like, like I did before all this happened, uh, just like a normal guy who happens to have an illness that a lot of people have misconceptions about. For Carolina Impact, I'm Beatrice Thompson reporting. Thanks so much, Bea. Harrison is now working on a career in voice work and auditioning for parts and commercials. For more on this residential care facility for mental health in Charlotte, please go to our website at pbscharlotte.org and click on the Carolina Impact page. We'll have plenty of information for you there. Well, imagine you're an accomplished professional in the financial industry, even earned a master's degree from Columbia University in statistics and became a teacher but you've always heard an inner calling to pursue art. Carolina Impact's Suzette Ree tells us one amazing artist story. When you see Val Chan in her studio, it's easy to think she's done this her whole life. She begins by drawing, then moves to paint, and the beauty of Mother Nature is often her inspiration. I think each of us has this um, capacity for creativity. Everyone has a different capacity, but I think it's actually necessary to practice it and to push it a little bit. It's like exercising a muscle. Creating art has always been a part of her life, but for Chan, her family's move to Charlotte almost three years ago seemed to be the perfect time to pursue her passion full time. It just seemed like the perfect opportunity to see where I could go with art. What if I gave myself permission to do this every day? Chan considers herself a multimedia artist. She likes layers and textures. I start with something very clean, like a clean uh, layer of paint. And then I just let myself draw acrylic markers. Then I go in and I have a selection of old magazines and old paper and books and I rip up the papers I like and I might collage it on. From collage, um, I go back to painting and it becomes this iterative process and I just go until it's done. Chan also loves to explore fiber art, creating with yarn, wool, felt. For Chan, it's all part of her creative process with results like this. I went to a yard sale and I found this fantastic metal sun. I think it used to have a terracotta, like actual sun in it, but I just found the rusted broken out frame. 
um, and I saw it and I just wanted to yarn bomb it. And here she recycled wood and turned it into a family totem pole to commemorate a special holiday together. And we each picked an animal to represent ourselves and I put them on, on the board and it's called Barnyard Totem. Before all this, Chan's professional life was about numbers, statistics. She got her master's degree at Columbia University and eventually taught high school statistics. Chan says the foundation in math for her was important. I had seen my parents struggle to make it in this country and it really mattered to me to be able to have a job and to be um, stable. So I pursued that. And she admits all that math likely influences her art today. I like to do things in series, and I do like things to flow, and I like them to be pretty. So that's the thread that runs through a lot of it, I think, uh, but I really like to explore different mediums. Chan also uses social media to share her art, like when she created this grid mosaic in several stages, showing colors and patterns, then showing how it all goes together in an interchangeable pattern. Chan has her own space at C3 Labs, where area artists gather, create, and support each other. Chan says it's a great way to connect to the creative community. So really what I want to be is just one piece in something really big. She also recently began teaching art at a children's studio, where she's sharing art in a whole new way. It took her years to get here to be able to create art every day. But for Val Chan, it was worth the wait. For Carolina Impact, I'm Suzette Ree. Thanks so much, Suzette. Val Chan was one of nine artists this year selected by the Arts and Science Council for the Community Supported Arts Program. The nine artists create 50 pieces of art for 50 art patrons who have bid in to collect the work of these new artists. Previous participants say it's a great way to get your work recognized. Well, that's all we have time for. We appreciate your time. Hope you'll tune in next time for Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. of PBS Charlotte.